This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, today's speaker today, Emily Pierce Segerman of the uh, is uh, Yale University Art Gallery's Ben Lee Damsky, Assistant Curator of Numismatics. That's almost as worthy as my title here. So yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, she holds an MA from the George Washington University and is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Birmingham. Uh, at Yale, Emily utilizes religious regalia and dress as interpretive lens through which ancient coins speak. Uh, her recent gallery rotation explores the traditions and transitions of empire in ancient Persia through personal adornment as depicted on coins. Today, Emily will present for us one of the more academic papers, uh, a little bit more theoretical, uh, uh, for this COAC uh, called Numis Meta, the rise of self-awareness on 18th and 19th century engravings. So please welcome Emily. Thanks for that introduction, Jesse. Um, I'd like to start today by extending my huge thanks to the Resolute Americana Collection and the Stack family for sponsoring this incredible gathering, um, and also to the incomparable Jesse Kraft and the American Numismatic Society for hosting this and welcoming me as a speaker. For those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, as Jesse said, my name is Emily Pierce Siegerman, and I'm the Ben Lee Damsky Assistant Curator of Numismatics for the Yale University Art Gallery. The theme of this year's conference, 18th and 19th century design and production, is overwhelming in its possibilities. Engraving tools, machinery, and art forms in the United States during this period experienced massive growth and development compared to global competitors. And that defined individuality comes across in multiple areas, notably tools of the trade, the formation of many dedicated engraving companies, and shifts in iconographic themes. Today, I will be exploring this last area, iconography, navigating where the modern medallic art forms begin in the early 18th century through to the moment of American medallic triumph in the Beaux Arts movement that occurred just before the First World War. Before delving into numismatic subject matter as engraved iconography, it must be understood in the context of the forming palette of American art. The development of American colonial art from its focus on Eden-like scenes and neoclassical Eurocentric traditional forms into its 19th century focus on the frontier, the sea, and everyday life is clear enough in other media, especially paintings, but it is not often considered through the lens of medallic art. The dominance of the Hudson River School in the East and American expansionist artists in the West have long eclipsed the importance of medallic engraving in these thematic developments of American art. Nevertheless, numismatic engravings played a vital role in the development and spread of this new North American palette. This paper will explore three domains of change in medallic iconography during the long 19th century. The Learned Society, American Miniature Portraiture, and finally, the American World's Fair. The so-called long 19th century, a designation of time most regularly encountered in the study of literature, is defined differently by scholars of different fields. Here, the long 19th century will be bound between two world-changing wars, the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789, and as I mentioned, the beginning of World War I in 1914. This period of revolution, change, and reformation is regularly studied by historians for the shifts in aesthetics, politics, culture, and everyday life. These same shifts are here explored in the depths or shallows of medallic engraving. Analysis of the mechanics behind portraiture and neoclassical self-obsession here commenced through a brief but intimate study of the medal awarding and commissioning entities of the age notably the Crown and the Scientific Society. Though this paper focuses on numismatic arts of the Americas and specifically the United States during the late or the long 19th century, excuse me, the story begins on the European continent and several hundred years earlier. 
During the 15th and 16th centuries, scientific activities began expanding through both the number of individuals conducting quote unquote scientific studies and benefactors willing to support them. The significant increases in wealth of the nobility and the shifts in education, not to mention the so-called scientific revolution, created a specific type of upper class individual with funding for and a baseline education to engage in new intellectual discussions. 16th and 17th century gentlemen academics conducted hypotheses, experiments, and deduced conclusions. They then printed these in texts and treatises marketed towards patrons with appetites similar to the authors. These individuals began to gather outside of the universities where they were free to discuss these new experiment-based conclusions with others fluent in the language of their relevant scientific disciplines. Rome's Accademia de Lince, founded by Duke Federico Sessi, was in many ways the first scientific society. Founded in 1603, society members include many familiar names like Galileo Galilei and Giovanni Ciampiole. Though the Academy's first iteration lasted only 27 years, it sparked the formation of several other learned societies across Europe. For example, two brothers of the Medici family, Duke Ferdinand II and Prince Leopold, founded the Academia de Cimentos not long after, and subsequent societies further spawned. Like an enlightened version of a pyramid scheme, these societies built up and off of one another, spreading across the European continent. This anonymous engraving of a never produced medal dating to about the 1630s celebrates the Academy's founder, Federico Sessi. Uh, I would like to mention this is not the Cardinal Federico Sessi, born in 1500, who has a wonderful medal in his honor engraved by John Federico Bonziani. Our Duke Federico Sessi was an Umbrian nobleman who founded the Academy alongside two other Umbrian noblemen at the age of 18. While not a society medal, the object serves as a defining image for the honor and, and the emblem of the society and begins our initial exploration into portraiture. Note how there is a mixture of naturalistic representation of Sessi. You see his nose, his facial hair, as well as deeply generalized attributes. The clothing of the age prevents any visual descriptions of his physique. So truly the only mechanism the viewer has to truly know who exactly is being depicted is the surrounding Latin text. One of the major successes of the 17th century societies was their prolific publication. The spread of systemic scientific inquiry through society publications, rather than solely the European university and a scholasticism reliant on classical texts, changed the paradigm of knowledge sharing and growth. These early European societies and their publications ultimately led to the creation of both the Parisian Académie des Sciences in 1660, and the Royal Society of London in 1662. By the 18th century, imitators of these two powerhouse societies had sprung up throughout Europe's capital cities, creating a model for subject-specific disciplinarians to gather, work, and discuss in local languages and dialects. While what would become the Royal Society of London was originally conceived as a salon type space for practitioners of all types of scientific discourse to meet, it soon weighed the natural sciences more heavily. The earliest medallic productions for both the Parisian Academy and the Royal Society exist first as published line engravings. The Academia des Sciences, a celebrated achievement of French monarch Louis XIV, was memorialized in a medal designed and produced by his Petite Academy, a part of the Sun King's so-called uniform series. Originally drawn and engraved, or excuse me, originally and drawn by Antoine Coipel, this became in many ways the society's first medal and is appropriately titled Establishment of the Academy of Sciences, circa 1666. It was ultimately engraved by John Mouji and likely Thomas Bernard in the reverse die. Alan Stahl's 2015 article titled, 
the classical program of the medallic series of Louis XIV, explores the creation of these and similar French medals from their, quote, occasional issue, some cast, others struck, some by royal direction, some by individuals or institutions, and some on the initiative of their artists, unquote, into Louis's organized and systemic productions crafted in concert by his Petite Academie. While not produced by the Academy, the medal does well illustrate the balance between the pursuit of new knowledge with reverence for the established monarchy. The honoring of royalty through the depiction of a bust of Louis XIV on the medal's obverse would become the typical iconography for Royal Society medals for the next two centuries across Europe and the United Kingdom. The reverse, too, set traditional iconographical subjects for society medals in both the new and old worlds. The reverse depicts Athena, resplendent with her owl at her feet, her staff in hand, and helmet atop her head as crown. She lounges on the Athenian Medusa shield, gazing out over her spoils. She is surrounded by tools and objects of scientific inquiry, including the armorelli sphere, mathematical drawings, natural history specimens in the skeleton at her feet, botany, and industry. This extreme nod to the classical world, married with symbols of modern intellectual pursuits, became the model for medallic arts across the 18th century, perhaps even more so than the simple neoclassical tendencies of contemporary portraiture. Like her Parisian counterpart, London's Royal Society soon embraced the medallic awards model. The Copley Medal awarded, quote, for sustained outstanding achievement in any field of science is renowned as the society's most impressive award. Created from Sir Godfrey Copley's bequest of a hundred pounds to the society in 1709, the first medal was awarded in 1731, 22 years after Copley's gift. Initially, the Copley Award was just that, an annual grant awarded for outstanding scientific achievement. However, in 1736, after much discussion, the Council of the Royal Society agreed to support a resolution of then Vice President Martin Folks to convert the award into a gold medal given for the, quote, best experiment, unquote. Unlike the French Academy's Mesle Prize, which awarded a financial incentive but no medal, and similar contemporary prizes, the Copley Medal was awarded for an undefinable success. Scientific achievement is deliciously ambiguous and allows a much wider berth of possible awardees. It also was not accompanied by a commercial opportunity, so something like a patent, and no longer included that initial financial award. The medal's obverse mirrors the style and presentation of the Medal of Mogi and Bernard, the establishment of the Academy of Sciences, though now it is graced with the glories of British ingenuity. Athena sits on a plinth clad in her armor and extending a wreath to the viewer, ostensibly the awardee, with her right hand. In her left, she holds the Ephesian Artemis, a cult statue of Artemis, symbolic of both the secrets of nature, but also the possibilities of archeological scientific discovery. A shield with the Copley crest casually leans against Athena's seat, and both she and the shield are surrounded by tools of experimentation and generic instruments of practical sciences. Rebecca Higgett's 2019 article titled, In the Society's Strongbox, A Visual and Material History of the Royal Society's Copley Medal, exceptionally explores the intentionality of the Copley Medal's iconographic composition and the many conversations, designs, and iterations that led to its ultimate making. In the words of Mark Jones, Mardalic iconographic design during the 18th century was, quote, a highly segmented process in which a sequence of specialists contributed to the final result, idea, motto or inscription, sketch, finished drawing, model, punchin, inscription, and die, and then parenthetically, and since medals have two sides, there were two sets of each of these, may all be the work of different individuals, unquote. 
But the establishment of the Academy of Sciences Medal and the Royal Society's Copley Medal are superb examples of this. The former produced by the many hands and minds of the Petite Academy, and the latter truly a product of the Royal Society and no less than seven involved members, though ultimately produced by medalist John Sigmund Tanner and the only medal struck while he served as chief engraver of the London Mint. In reaction to the Royal Society's Thank you. Increased focus on the natural sciences, art, excuse me, arts and agricultural focused societies became vogue foundations of the 18th century. The Society for the Encouragements of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce, referred to as the Society for Brevity, was in many ways a humanities response to London's Royal Society. Founded in 1751, excuse me, 1754 by William Shipley, the original society sought to increase the arts and the craft industries through the award of various prizes funded by the London public. The society was integrally involved in the creation and establishment of the Great Exhibition held in London in 1851, and we will come back to that. The society prior to the Society of Antiquaries splitting from it was also the initial forum for British numismatists as exemplified in the Gentleman's Magazine. In just a second, a slide will appear that has a picture from the Gentleman's Magazine, thank you again, um, uh, with a very brief and enthusiastic description of our beloved Libertas Americana medal. With these outcroppings of new societies, fashion quickly indicated that a discipline is only as good as its society. As such, the incomparable field of numismatics could not lag behind. A group of collectors who called themselves Friends of Numismatic Science, founded London's Numismatic Society on December 2nd, 1836, receiving its royal charter in 1904. Returning back to London Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures, and Commerce, the precursor to the modern day RSA, there is a clear moment where the push and pull between designating awarders and awardees can be felt, even in the historic documents. The RSA's initial selection of prizes had two main focuses, the harvesting of raw materials and the development of artistic skills. These two foci are particularly potent to numismatic engravers, as the first can be thought to describe the medium with which metallic engraving engravers work, and the second encourages the study of their artistic craft. And of course, the RSA's prizes and awards only increased in number. By 1773, the RSA posted awards for 259 different classes, 33 of these classified under, quote, premiums for promoting the polite arts, unquote. Chief among these was the award, quote, for the best drawing of any kind, made with chalk, black lead, pen, India ink, or bister, by a young gentlemen under the age of 21, sons or grandsons of peers and peeresses in their own right, of Great Britain or Ireland, unquote. And the prize for this honor, the society's gold medal. The gold medal designed by Italian engraver, Thomas Pinjot, continues the American, or excuse me, continues the Academy des Sciences and the Royal Society's Copley medals forms in medallic designs, but now with an even more magnified portrayal of Britain. A personified Britannia sits facing left, she is graced with honors offered to her by Mercury and Athena, who present her with wreaths and gifts. Note how Athena has moved from the position of the honor and to the supplicant. A shield with the Union Jack rests on her seat as she graciously receives the divine accolades. The RSA's pursuits veered strongly into the agricultural and industrial, meaning that prizes were increasingly offered for new inventions which celebrated any good mechanization of harvest and planting. By 1761, the RSA held regular exhibitions of such inventions and often invited artists and artisans to offer guidance to visitors in much the same way that cultural institutions of today will employ docents to give tours to the public. But while tensions developed over rules and restrictions, inventors from patenting winning submissions, 
these competitors in the polite arts had only to contend with one another. The RSA's other major contribution to numismatics was, as mentioned earlier, the introduction of the Great Exhibition of 1851, and as consequence, all following international exhibitions. The subsequent need for official and souvenir medals and tokens invigorated numismatics and the need for qualified and fast engravers of medals. Rather than exploring the historical progression and development of the Great Exhibition of 1851 and the following World's Fairs, the iconographical comparisons between medals issued for these fairs against those crafted for royalty and the learned societies offer, I think, a more rewarding and visually interesting study, foreshadowing those of North American medals. Designs for all medals commissioned for the Great Exhibition were, in classic RSA form, the product of competition. Ultimately, five main types of medallic awards were agreed upon, designed by four artists, and all types were produced in bronze, as bronze was considered the most appropriate to foster ingenuity and craft and skill required for medallic art by the Royal Mint. The most prestigious award, and now one of the rarest to acquire, was the Council Award. With a production series of approximately 170 medals, exhibition juries awarded these to contributors deemed the most outstanding. The obverse, designed by William Wyon, depicts conjoined portrait busts of Prince Albert in the background and Queen Victoria in the foreground. Victoria is crowned with a laurel wreath and adorned with impressive pendant earrings. Immediately below her coiffed hair, a prominent trident celebrates Britain's imperial naval strength, as do the two dolphins swimming beneath the bust. The reverse, designed by Pierre Hippolyte Bonadel and Joseph Francois de Mard, steps away from celebrating the monarch and empire in favor of the exhibition's main event, the celebration of trade and manufacturing. The central figure, Britannia, is dressed in classical robes with her arms outstretched in blessing. She holds laurel branches over commerce, wearing the guise of mercury and industry. Commerce and industry shake hands beneath her blessing gesture, standing between the elements of their crafts. In the background, a cacophony of national flags peeks out. Smaller prize medals were awarded to exhibitors of high merit. Like the Council Award, these were given based on a jury selection. 2,918 exhibitors were selected for this honor based on their exhibitions or presentations, beauty, utility, and craftsmanship. The obverse of the prize medal is the same design as the Council Award, again designed by William Wyon. The reverse, however, designed by Wyon's son, Leonard Charles Wyon, presents Britannia seated on a throne bestowing a laurel wreath to industry while raising up the, the kneeling figure. Behind industry, personifications of the four continents, Asia, America, Europe, and Africa, look on in celebration. The three remaining commissioned medal types were the Juror's Medal, the Service Medal, and Exhibitor Medal. All five designs share iconographic qualities that have become emblematic of this moment, neoclassical depictions of allegorical or royal figures, nationalistic narratives of excellence, and the use of Latin legends to name a few. As such, they will here stand for the typical or expected subject matter of medallic engravings in the age of industry. With these strong neoclassical depictions of royals and national ingenuity in mind, it's time to finally travel to the United States. British North American practitioners of various fields founded learned societies in limited numbers until the conclusion of the American Revolutionary War, largely thanks to John Adams. Adams' 1776 resolution to establish, quote, in every colony, a society for the improvement of agriculture, arts, manufacturers, and commerce was not participated in by all colonies. However, Massachusetts used the Congressional Endorsed Resolution to create the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1780. 
In his inaugural address, Academy President James Bowden celebrated the role of American learned societies in advancing the progress made by European scientific societies to, quote, aid and invigorate the individual, benefiting by their production, not only the communities in which they are respectively instituted, but America and the world in general, unquote. This encompassed a wide berth of professional interests, including natural philosophy, geography, astronomy, and history. From 1791 to 1830, the young nation exploded with scholars founding societies with very specific professional affiliations, including the New York Historical Society in 1804, the Academy of Natural Sciences in 1812, and importantly, the American Numismatic Society in 1858. The New York Society for the Promotion of Agriculture, Arts, and Manufactures, founded in 1791 and originally housed in Federal Hall, here engraved by Joseph Lang, was in many ways the United States version of London's RSA. By 1804, it was renamed the New York Society for the Promotion of Useful Arts and was colloquially referred to as just the Society of Arts. The Society of Arts shared many attributes with the RSA, even a focus on agriculture. Like the RSA and her sister societies in the old world, these North American societies served as the main impetus in the pursuit and dissemination of knowledge. They, all, excuse me, they offered their communities opportunities to publish and advance discipline-related study and skill, but also symbolized the cultural and scientific independence of the fledgling nation. Unlike the RSA, however, North American societies did not seemingly offer as many awards in the form of medals to incentivize mechanical innovation and artistic skill. New York Society of Arts did not offer medallic prizes at all. Instead, it instituted a system based off of premiums, small financial incentives, to limited success. Ultimately for New York and for most of North America, the greatest incentive was the agricultural fair and the industrial exhibition. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the first North American society I mentioned, did not offer an award medal of any kind until 1839 with the creation of the Rumford Prize. In 1796, Benjamin Thompson, the Count Rumford, gifted $5,000 to establish the Academy's prize in the form of two medals, one gold and one silver. 43 years later, the first recipient would be awarded the honor for work in heat and light. Designed by engraver Moritz Furst, the prize medal depicts the Count von Rumford in profile facing left. The reverse is devoid of figures with a legend that reads, Rumford Medal for Discoveries in Light or Heat, awarded by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, followed by a dedication to the awardee. I should mention the Rumford Medal is a separate prize from the Rumford Prize, but both are medals. First, a Hungarian-born engraver who worked for both private and government commissions also designed and engraved the American Institute's Silver Award Medal struck in 1838. This medal's obverse is extremely similar to products being commissioned by European learned societies and the commissions for the exhibition, for the great exhibition medals. Here, Columbia reclines behind a shield, bestowing a wreath to an unseen figure before her, perhaps the awardee. She is flanked by sheaves of wheat and a spinning wheel to her left. A cornucopia overflows to her right, and an eagle stands atop a horn, gazing up to the Pileus that sits atop her staff. Like the Rumford Prize, the reverse dedicates the medal to the award recipient and text surrounded by a bordering wreath of laurel. There is clear separation between first designs for commissioned and private consumers and those he created for government directives, arguably excluding the Rumford Prize, as we'll see. And the disparity between the two types well illustrates one of the distinguishing components of American medallic engraving. His private commissions like the American Institute Award Medal, follow the fashions of European society medals. Iconographically, they are the same flavor. 
and his creations board of government commissions, we see almost exclusively a form of portraiture distinct in the palette of American and United States decoration. The American tradition of portrait medals, while clearly influenced by that of Europe and the United Kingdom, are distinct in their design elements. The oft included ornamentation and symbolism is not novel. Things like the eagle, Columbia, a Phrygian cap, and so on, are expected elements of the engraved design. What is unique, however, is the American portrait medal in the context of American portraiture, and notably portrait miniatures, and the detail and specificity in physical representation that make American portrait medals of the 19th century so unique and alluring. Art historically, the subject matter also deviates from European aspects of portraiture as a vehicle solely for study. In 18th century England, portraits, especially portraits in miniature, were intimate private objects that rendered both social and economic values. Social values would be attributed to the sentimentality of the image, almost as a reliquary to be used for personal reflection and adoration. The importance of keeping such valuable material safe and cared for and held in reverence were captured with things like a locket at one's wrist, at the neck, or a watch case. Sentimental value of such items becomes extremely gendered by the second half of the century. For women, the selling of a coveted portrait miniature was viewed as a parallel of selling her body, while for men to display the adornment of a portrait miniature was effeminate and emasculating. All this to say that portrait in miniature, meant to be held and meditated upon, was an object of extreme social and personal nature and communicated a significant amount of social information to the world. As an object of economic value, however, a portrait miniature was weighed by the setting in which it was placed. Again, looking at examples of things like a locket or a watch case. The casing or mounting of these deeply intimate objects became opportunities for opulent adornment demonstrating various strata of society. The object, in the words of art historian Marcia Ponton, as, quote, an image introduced into a container made of precious materials fused economic and sentimental value. The worth of the subject was irrevocably endorsed by the precious materials, unquote. Thus setting up the craftsman with opportunity to paint, case, and embellish in a single commission if they had all three talents. So too with medalists. First, for example, is likely most well known for his portrait medals, perhaps his Indian peace medals, but allow me the honor. While we see his skill as a portraitist in this early Rumford medal, his craft is perfected in his medals which celebrate heroes of the War of 1812. In each, he presents the honored figure in profile, surrounded by text, and usually in Latin naming him. The reverse of these depict either a Rococo neoclassical personification of some noble leading, as we've seen in the European medals, or more importantly, a battlescape most often at sea. His presentation medals for, in order, Oliver Hazard Perry, Lewis Warrington, Thomas McDonough, and James Biddle are exemplar of this. All four portraits are produced in the same style. Furthermore, each person is depicted dressed in the new US Navy blue uniform, a full dress coat based off of the orders issued in 1813. Each man additionally wears the typical sideburns of a seaman and almost identical hairstyles. Yet for all of these commonalities and similarities of dress, each man is distinctly himself. First attention to physical features is almost obsessive. The naturalistic and deeply personal qualities of noses, eyes, brows, chins, and even ears sets the sailor apart. I'd like to just point to the screen using the laser pointer um, to demonstrate a couple of these pieces. We can see Perry's chin is very, very different from let's say Lewis Warrington. Uh, we see Warrington's forehead and the way the hair is flowing off him as if in wind is again strikingly different 
from the others. Biddle's muzzle is so specific and absolutely rendered the same in every portrait I've ever seen of him. Um, and McDonough's jaw, similar to Perry's, is extremely handsome. Their identity would have been instantly and absolutely clear to any who knew them. The almost intimate depictions seen in these engravings is only a product of the portrait miniature traditions. And this is so deeply integrated into medallic engravings of the United States during the 19th century that I argue the two become inseparable. By the mid 1800s, the tenderness of such specific human representation became married to that neoclassical representation of relevant trade tools to produce a flavor unique to the US. I'd like to mention also for a full corpus of first metal production for North America, I encourage you to explore my COAC predecessor, Chris Newzill's 1997 presentation titled A Reckoning of Moritz's First American Metals. The reverse of these medals, as I mentioned, each depict a maritime battle scene, reflecting pivotal moments of the young Navy's activities during the war. Though the point of the reverse scenes is indeed to represent a victorious battle, the topic itself speaks loudly to the growing appetites of American art connoisseurs. The frontier, the sea, and everyday life dominated up and coming American paintings and sculptures. Here, the depictions of vessels at sea are rendered through meticulous naturalism. Rather than a presentation of something like Poseidon ushering in victory to deified sailors or Triton joining American sailors in battle, first engraved intricately detailed and realistic scenes of sail, warfare, and maritime buffeting of ships, land, and sailor. Like the intimacy of his portraiture, first naturalistic representation of the sea, rather than a romanticized neoclassical iconography, demonstrates the role of medallic arts in this growing palette of American art. He is a dynamo and one of many American medalists or European working for American mints medalists who developed a new sense of naturalism in the medallic arts. And these names include other famous figures like Charles Cushing Wright, Anthony Paquette, and the barber father and son team, William and Charles. The foundation of naturalism and realistic human figures and landscapes led to an explosion of medallic arts in the World's Columbian Exposition, also known as the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The Columbian Exposition was the first major opportunity for sculptures like our patron saint of 19th century art in numismatics, Augustus St. Gaudens, to display their skills with metal craft. As mentioned at the start of this paper, one of the major advancements of American medallic production of the long 19th century was the massive progression in technology. Reducing machines, notably the significant improvements in the pantograph, allowed artists skilled in molding to create high relief miniature pieces. The development of the pantograph technology strangely connects American medallic engraving again to the Great Exhibition of 1851. This Hill pantograph, created by C.J. Hill, advanced the designs of previous iterations of the machine to now lay the galvano and the hub horizontally rather than vertically. Hill received a British patent for his machine in 1866 before almost immediately selling the rights to William Wyon, whom I mentioned earlier as the engraver of the majority of the Great Exhibition's commissioned medals. The U.S. purchased the Hill pantograph from Wyon the following year, 1867, and employed it again immediately, albeit using it only as a portion of its capabilities. In the words of Mint director Henry R. Lindelman, it was used exclusively to, quote, reduce copies of base reliefs by which the freedom of execution of the larger model is susceptible in the hands of the artist, can be preserved in the most minute proportions, unquote. While the U.S. built, excuse me, while the U.S. Mint would move on to the Janvier pantograph 50 years later, Wyon's sale of the Hill pantograph was the catalyst for the, additional of, the addition of many sculptors into the U.S. Mint circle. St. Gaudens, in a way, led the charge for his sculptor peers to add metal and coin to their media of work. 
The World's Columbian Exposition was not the first World's Fair held in the United States. It also was not the first to have a significant number of medals and tokens produced in commemoration. Preceded by the 1853 International Exhibition in New York, the 1876 U.S. Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, and the 1884 New Orleans Centennial Exposition, the Columbian Exposition celebrated the 400th anniversary of its namesake's arrival in the Americas in 1492. The exposition had a world-shifting impact on architecture and was instrumental in bringing the Beaux Arts movement from France to the United States and most clearly to New York City. While the architectural vigor is palpable in the historic texts, the exhibitions, and many of the expositions award medals and tokens, this often overshadows an equally significant moment in American medallic art history, best illustrated in the official Chicago Columbian Exposition Award Medal, designed and engraved first by Augustus St. Gaudens and then Charles Barber. Beginning with the reverse iconography designed by Barber, our sixth chief engraver of the U.S. Mint in 1892, his medal epitomizes the medallic traditions of Europe. He presents opulent neoclassical motifs paired with the tools of modern technological discovery, like those European society medals. Two winged allegorical nude female figures flank a globe at the top. They hold a trumpet and laurel wreath on our left and a stylist and tablet on the right, respectively symbolic of awarding authorities who would bestow the medal to its recipients. Below the winged figure and globe is a large rectangular area where the awardee would be named using a drop-in die. This specimen from the Yale University Art Gallery was awarded to two Yale graduates, uh, James Dwight Dana and his son, Edward Salisbury Dana, for their work in mineralogy and geological studies. At the bottom, a small depiction of the Santa Maria at full sail is visible, and two large torches aflame flank the full cartouche. The reverse's two most important iconographical components are the globe and the vessel at sail, both equally representative of navigation. While perhaps something like a sextant or an octant might have been a more appropriate tool, the design should be understood at least in part as having been created in the context of need and speed. St. Gaudens original medallic design was for both the obverse and the reverse. His initial reverse design centered around a personification of the spirit of America. The personification, however, was a young male nude who, shameless in his nakedness, was judged inappropriate by the deciding committee. St. Gaudens acquiesced, providing two additional, more modest designs, one with that same figure slightly covered, and a second depicting an eagle surrounded by wreath. Both were rejected, and the sculptor eventually conceded to Barber's design, though not happily. This moment of tension between the mint's chief engraver and one of the rising stars of the 19th century art market is representative of a rift that continues to this day. The friction between medallic engraving as fine art and medallic engraving as decorative arts adorning objects of utility is still sometimes felt in the field. Nevertheless, this also highlights the many uses and appreciations of 19th century American engravings. St. Gaudens and Charles Barber's medallic design began the final chapter of the nation's engraving adolescence, which brings us to the medal's obverse. St. Gaudens' design harkens back to first naturalistic representation of US military heroes, but compositionally expounds the image further. Columbus's full body is shown rather than just his portrait. He steps onto American soil, making landfall while lifting his arms out wide in a gesture of triumph, relief, and wonder. Columbus's gaze is heavenward, his eyebrows raised, perhaps in supplication, matching the deliverance communicated with his arms, and his mouth slightly open, almost audibly sighs in relief and respite. Columbus's facial features are his own, or at least his own as revealed to us through Renaissance era portraiture and representations. By comparison, his three companions, only one, maybe one and a half of whose faces we can actually see, are much less detailed. 
clearly supporting figures. Above these individuals are the Pillars of Hercules and the Spanish Caravels with the Latin inscription plus ultra. In his depiction of Columbus, St. Gaudens takes the individuality and intimacy of American portraiture and goes a step beyond. On the reverse, Barber relaxes into the traditional depictions utilized by American learned societies and by extension their European influencers. While Barber's reverse compares to the obverse is lethargic, it speaks very clearly the language of medallic iconography, which had formed for the past almost two centuries, born of society awards and government commissions. When combined, the sides of the medals offered example of a decidedly North American medallic tradition. This sojourn through the medallic iconography of the so-called long 19th century has been a shallow exploration of the multitude of metal engravers who transformed American fine arts. Starting with the learned and scientific societies of Europe and the United Kingdom and their successors in North America, the production of metals with deeply neoclassical scenes married with depictions of modern tools and the creation of many peoples and minds, though often produced by a single, sometimes two, engravers. Metals of the 18th century transform into something more personal and intimate at the onset of the 19th century by mimicking American miniature portraiture, increasing the product of a single brilliant engraver completing commissions or creations. The 19th century draws to a close with the Columbian Exposition and its medallic magnificence brought about by technological innovation, thus allowing sculptors and artists to join traditional coin and metal engravers in producing medallic art, and soon after introducing the Beaux Arts movement of France into North American metals. And with that, I thank you for joining me and I will welcome any questions or comments. Any questions from the crowd? Thank you so much, Emily. Got one up. Uh, that gold medal uh, awarded to Captain Bly for transporting breadfruits, do you have that? Is that at Yale? No. That's a remarkable thing. I know. Uh, I assume you know the significance of the breadfruit. I, I sure do. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Never saw that. Before. Yeah, that was definitely one that I was drilling over upon finding. Um, Any idea where it is? No. Does Colonial Williamsburg have one? We do not. Have okay. One. No. Great. Great. No. <laughs> yeah. What was the source of it? Let me go back and slide. It was an auction. I think it was Baldwin's. Yeah. yeah. The Aussies maybe. <laughs> Yeah, the question you got one on the back. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Just, uh, Thank you. I will amend that in the paper. Um, a lot of the the mid nineteenth century medals you showed, the mm -hmm. the first medals, they're really, I mean, in my opinion, they're the the top of American medallic art at the time. Uh, and they were also very much official in nature being produced at the Philadelphia Mint for the government. Um, there, there were a lot of um, more unofficial private engravers that were working. Um, can you speak a little bit about their connection with the, the broader artistic medallic movements at the time? Oh, sure. That's, um, I'll be brief because I can go for a while. It's not dissimilar from first. I think first is perhaps more emotional because he had, um, you know, the assistant directorship and directorship just like dangled in front of him for so many years. Um, but we see through those other artists you mentioned, again, that transition into something more intimate and more personal. And while portraiture in the metal work of the European continent is beautiful, it's not quite the same. Um, I almost don't have a vocabulary for it because it's so, the ethos is so impactful, which I know sounds like our historical nonsense, but um, it really is. They're, they're totally evocative of an intimate interaction with each object, um, which is why I love them and why I love those War of 1812 medals as well. Are there questions? We have one on any online or any more in the audience. 
Yeah, um, hi. Could I ask for a question, please? Of course, please do. Okay. Hi. Um, my father, who is now deceased, for years collected all kinds of material from the Columbian Exposition and the 1876. And I have trays and boxes full of it, which I've never really spent any time on. My question is, does Yale tend to have representation from all sorts of metals and ribbons and material from these periods in its collection? Would you know? I do, and we do have them. Um, we do not have, how do I say this? We have a fine collection. We do not have the best collection of this material, um, but we're interested in growing if you're offering. I uh, will just throw that out there. Okay, so perhaps if, when I get time, I'll at least start listing things and send it to you. You can- Absolutely. So you want, I, I don't want to duplicate what you have, but I, I think he would want, my brother, my daughter-in-law went to Yale, my brother went to Yale, and we bleed for Yale, so I know they would <laughs> Be, no, no, they would, they would want to. Well, know, very I, good. I love a bulldog. That's very good. Um, I, I, I I'll would. Be, I'll be in touch as soon as I can get take the time to go through these boxes and list. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. I will but, use this platform as a moment to just say our website has been recently revamped, and we're going through and re-photographing many of our objects. So I invite you all online and in person to explore, see what we have, um, and. Stay tuned for the next couple of years because I think we will continue to expand. Okay, and this is just a slight comment that I have used the Yale uh, site for a number of years mm -hmm. and it's been amazingly useful for some of the pieces that are up there. Uh, I really suggest that people take a look at it and just occasional searches and see what's there, things that you would not normally expect to find. Excellent job. Thank you. Any other questions from the crowd? Uh, I think I may have seen something pop up online, not 100% sure though. Uh, if not, please give us a round of applause. <laughs>